Hey there, everybody. It is Irene Lyon here. Welcome to this live stream. If you're watching this now, you're probably not watching this live. You're watching the recording. So thank you for being here and tuning in. And just as I get set up here, I am going to ensure I've got uh, a strong signal. It looks like I do. And um, I have some questions that have already been submitted. Um, we're going to talk about the topic of anger and healthy aggression. And we're going to probably go maybe 45 minutes to an hour. We'll see where we get. But this is a big topic, the topic of anger and healthy aggression, working with it, um, and what it is. And today, I'm going to be digging into more around what is healthy aggression and what actually is anger and what do they mean our culture right now is very unsure about what these topics are, what these emotions are, and for good reason. We have kind of stuffed them down in our bodies, in our communities, and now these emotions, these primal essential emotions, are coming out in ways that are not very healthy. They're coming out in the form of violence, harm, abuse, rage. Um, we would call uh, it even to toxic abuse, toxic shame, and all these kind of blend together. So there's a, a big story here that is more than just what you're going to hear from me today, but I wanted to start the conversation. If you have not yet seen some of my other articles and concepts and writings around the topic of anger and aggression, be sure to check those out. I will. We will link some of those. One article in particular that I'm thinking about right now is called the real deal on fear and why we are masters of, at avoiding it. So be sure to check that one out. I'll get my assistant, Crystal, to pop that into the chat. And who is here? I'm curious if I can, let's just see if I can see some of those of you who are here. It looks like I've got 18, um, 18 nervous systems here. Let me know where you're from, where you're watching from, and let's see if I can find that. I see one person, Melissa here. Hey, Melissa. I'd also love to know where people are coming from. So where are you coming from? Hey, Deanna um, from Carmel. Deanna is one of our members in Smart Body, Smart Mind. I uh, got Rachel from Indianapolis. Hey, Rachel. One of my best buds is from Indy. Uh, Melissa from Florida. Flavia from Brazil, the Netherlands, Austin, Texas, Josephine. Um, Josephine's all the way down in Australia. She's another one of my students in Smart Body, Smart Mind. Connecticut, Columbia, awesome. Um, Milwaukee, Michigan. We got people from all over. South Korea, that is wonderful. Thank you for tuning in. So good. Makes me happy to see the global system wanting to learn about this topic. So quick note, I am a somatic experiencing practitioner. If you're brand new to me, if you haven't checked out my website, be sure to do that. My name, irenelion.com. As I said, what we're going to cover today is a tiny smidgen of this topic in its entirety. Um, but what I want to really convey to you today is that this idea of working with healthy aggression, restoring our healthy aggression and anger is essential. And um, I do this work with my clients in my online programs. I was in private practice for quite a few years, working with people one-on-one, -on -one, helping them bring up their inner animal, wake their tiger, as one of my mentors, Peter Levine, would say, founder of Somatic Experiencing. And what we have to really understand as human beings here on planet Earth is that we are, we're animals. So we have animal physiology. We have animal mammalian nervous systems. We are born with a nervous system that wants to protect us via our fight flight responses. And it also wants to protect us via our freeze responses. This is part of the conversation that I teach over on my YouTube channel and within my groups and my programs. But suffice it to say, learning about what we call our autonomic nervous system, those are the fight flight freeze elements, and I'm mentioning this because it's important. So I'm going to get into anger. Don't worry. But the autonomic nervous system keeps us alive. It keeps us safe. It allows me to know if there's a large bang outside of my house, I, I might alert to it. I might see it. 
and be like, what is that? I orient to it to defend, to protect, or I might realize, oh, that was just um, a guy hammering the roof next door because there's actually a guy hanger, hammering my the roof next door. They're replacing a roof. So apologies if you hear some hammering. But that is, a, we could consider a threat. We might look to it, realize, oh, he's just hammering. Not a big deal. I come back to you guys. So our fight flight mechanisms are there for a reason. Our shutdown mechanisms are also there for a reason. And those shutdown mechanisms are actually a big part of what we need to understand and work with as we start to restore healthy aggression and bring back the emotion of anger. Now, quick note, there are sort of six basic human emotions. These are the ones that Darwin studied way back in the day. I'm not good with my history and dates, but the six main ones are sadness, happiness, or we would say joy, fear, disgust, surprise, and anger. And the emotion of disgust actually goes hand in hand with emo with anger. It also goes hand in hand with shame. And I'll get into that a little bit. Um, the one thing that you're going to see in here as we get into these questions is a lot of the answers are similar. And there's reason for that. And it's because what I said at the very beginning or a few moments ago, we're all biological beings as humans, we're mammalian and we have these basic primal emotions, say them again, sadness, joy or happiness, fear, disgust, surprise and anger. We share that with other mammalian creatures, especially primates. And what we've come across at least in human society and human culture, especially since we domesticated plants and animals. So this story goes way back, way back, thousands, tens of thousands of years. When we started to domesticate our species as humans, we started to lose our natural flow with the environment. We started to lose our natural flow with our nature. And I say our nature very deliberately because we have to remember and maybe take a second to really land into this. We are nature, right? Think about that for a second. If you have not considered that, consider it. We would consider the wild animals part of nature, the insects, the creepy crawlies, the birds, the ocean, the trees, and we're of the same matter. We are organic beings, but we've become so industrialized and so westernized and so culturalized that we have forgotten biologically that we have these emotions, these needs, these desires to get things out of our system to feel better. So the root, I'll get into aggression right now. And every now and again, I'm looking down. It's just to make sure I've got my assistant online too with me that everything is running smoothly. So when I lose my contact with you guys, it's because I'm just checking in to make, make sure everything's okay. Um, hello from people who are popping in. We've got Edinburgh and Nova Scotia and India. So cool. Okay. So quick little um, maybe we could call this a definition of aggression. So I'm going to read this so I don't forget all the details. So aggression, healthy aggression, or the, the, ner the name, the term aggression, it's actually a verb, and it's Latin. It's from the Latin language, and it is egredi. I'm not sure if I'm saying that with proper Latin pronunciation, but egredi, spelled A-G-G-E-D-I, A G G. A-G-G-R-E-D-I, I should say. And that means in Latin to approach, to advance, to go forward. And then the further definitions to attack, to undertake, to seize, to attempt to act. It's a sense of I can. And when you listen to the root of this word from Latin, it has very little to do with actually harming, with actually attacking and causing harm and fighting. It is this sense of moving forward, of showing up and being like, I want that, I can, et cetera. And it's important to understand that anger is an emotion, it's a feeling, it's a quality, but it isn't the action of attacking, of, of hitting, of striking. It's the feeling, it's the quality, before that occurs. If you can think about a time when maybe, mm, I'll use something simple for many of us in our society, we drive cars, I know I do, 
Sometimes something happens that angers us, that pisses us off. Maybe someone cuts us off. And if you really watch your physiology, there will be a, a bubbling. Does anybody here else get that? A bubbling, a feeling, a frustration, an irritation. It's that. That is the anger. That is the aggression. The screaming, the acting out, maybe cutting another person off or snapping at somebody later in the day because that aggressive tendency wasn't properly moved through in your body. That is, in a, in a sense, the old energy coming out in a way that is unrefined. Now, you might be wondering, where does this come from? How do we, or, or how do we work with this? And it starts really young, this concept of healthy aggression. And I'm going to define that a little bit right now. I will have a video coming out on this very soon in a few weeks. So be sure to check out that. But it starts really young. It starts in infancy. And after I answer this part, I will get to the questions because it's important to set the stage for this. So when we come out of mom's womb and we're in the world and we're healthy neurologically, and we start to do things with her when we are maybe feeding or when she's holding us, or it could be even um, a, another caregiver. It doesn't have to be the mother. And the baby, the infant, they're at an age where they can't talk, they can't walk. They're still very, very immature, let's say 12 months, 13 months, maybe even eight months, somewhere around there. It depends on their physiology. They will start to hit. They'll start to scratch. They'll start to tug on mom's hair. Um, they might start to bite. Now, this is a sign of, believe it or not, energy. This is a sign of healthy aggression. What it is, is these little ones are starting to find their energy. They're like, holy cow, I am this little creature and I'm connecting with someone and it's coming out, this energy, and I just want to hit, I want to scratch, I want to pull, I want to bite. At that age, they don't know what they're doing other than feeling what we would call life force energy. This is that healthy aggression, this pushing forward. As I mentioned, the root of healthy aggression from Latin agredi is to uh, undertake, to, to seize, to say, I can. Now, think about this for one second. I'm going to come back. I teach kind of in circles. So one of the hallmarks of someone who cannot express healthy aggression and anger and feel it and process it and contain it is depression. It is this very low energy, postural collapse, depressive introversion, not wanting to make contact kind of archetype in the body. And so if we think about that little baby that is starting to find its healthy aggression, it is very, very important when that occurs that that energy, that animalistic energy, is met by the caregiver with a sense of, oh my goodness, you are so strong, and I feel you, and I see you, and I am here, and let's just take those hands and play with them. There's often this sense of, but it hurts, it's not nice, um, we shouldn't be teaching our children and our babies to harm us. Here's the thing, at that age, they're not harming, they're actually finding their energy. And how that energy is met will greatly determine how that little person, how their biology moves forward in life and finds their own body. If you look at this other, I'll paint a different scenario, let's just say babies pulling hair, scratching, biting, and the mother or caregiver is shocked, stunned, thinks this little monster is hurting me, how dare they, this isn't cool, take the baby, put it down, or pass them off to someone else. Or what we know, and I've, I know happens, because I've heard this in various passings, they are then hit, or they are bit back, or they are yanked away and said, bad baby, that is not right. At that age, that starts the process of shutting that healthy aggression down. And I have a saying that I say to my students, this is nobody's fault and it's everyone's fault. By that I mean, it, it really is nobody's fault because we have not taught this um, to our current Western civilizations. In more tribal cultures, this is just intuitively there. They play with that aggression, they celebrate it. 
in our more, we would call industrialized societies, we see that as harmful, not nice, and we shut it down. The trouble with that is it then creates this mm, domino effect, if you will, where that baby so early on, I'm going to say a very important word here, so listen up, that baby somatically, body sense, their soma, their physiology, their cells, they start to feel small. They start to feel shy and insular and not wanting to reach out. Because when I reached out, I was punished. It didn't feel good. And so this is how we're seeing now that a lot of deep, deep depression, the inability to move forward, people who are stuck, who can't feel this energy, they don't know what to do with the aggression. We could probably, and I'm making an assumption here, but the more and more I do this work with my mentors and my clients and my people, we see that this could be traced back to as far back as that first interaction with mama and her own ability or father or caregiver, their inability to really be with that aggression and encourage it, celebrate it, but redirect it in a way that is healthy as opposed to shutting it down. And the shutdown response is one of the key physiological responses of the autonomic nervous system, the freeze response, that dorsal shutdown response. So if we do something like that to a child and shut them down by saying, no, that's not good, go to your room even, for example, for an older child, but if we think of an infant, they will shut down because that is their default mechanism to survive. They realize, I don't like the feeling of this. I'm going to stop exerting my healthy force, my energy, being strong, because when I do that, I am disconnected from. That makes sense? Let me know if that makes sense. I'm disconnected from. My connection, my love, my care, my safety, this caregiver is saying to me, if I get this energy out, I'm going to be put down, I'm going to be disconnected from, and that to a little somatic feeling baby is death. And I know this might seem a little extreme, but this is where this starts. So it's very important to understand where our healthy aggression starts, why and how we want to foster it and encourage it and redirect it in a way that's more contained and safe, but not shut it down and say, bad kid, that's not right. Don't do that it sets up this cycle that we are seeing right now in our culture, which is kids, adults, people, cultures, not knowing how to process their anger and healthy aggression. And what occurs, it comes out as violence. It comes out as hate. It comes out as criminal activity. It comes out as doing the same thing to our children because we weren't taught otherwise. So that is my um, quick little snippet on healthy aggression, how it starts, how it starts to move. Another example, and then I will get to the questions. You'll see why these are important. When a toddler, for example, is little and they're starting to move through the world and they see maybe candy they want, or they see a truck they want, or they see a dog's tail that they want to pull. If they see that, that say candy or that truck, and they say, I want that, right? That's what I want. Remember, go back to the, the root of healthy aggression. Agredi means to move forward, to ask, to seize, to undertake. If they are feeling that want, and we can parallel this to adult life asking for what we need or setting a boundary. I hope you see the parallel there. But let's just say that little kid wants that toy. Do you really think they want it? What do you guys think? Yes, of course they want it. They're not playing a mind game. They want that truck. They want to play with it or they want that candy. They want to eat it. And if the parent or the caregiver or the daycare worker says, you don't want that. No, you don't want that. And then they get distracted because they don't want to see conflict maybe between the siblings or the other kids. They are essentially screwing up for back, <laughs> lack of a better word. They're messing with that child's mind that's like, I want that. This is what I need. And as soon as we say, you don't want that, it, it causes this bind, this paradoxical confusion. And this is where we start to breed a mind that doesn't understand what's going on. I want that. Someone says, oh, I don't want that. Okay. So 
in that example, for example, say a kid wants something, their healthy aggression is going after it. They know what they want. They want to seize the day and maybe they can't have it. Then we would say something like, holy moly, I see you really want that thing. And you know what? You can't have it right now because little Susie's playing with it and we want to share. We're supposed to teach kids how to share. Very good example there. Or I know you want that candy and you know what? The candy will be there tomorrow as opposed to the, the bribes of, oh, if you eat all your vegetables, then we'll give you that candy. That, stuff, that starts up something totally different that we won't go into right now. But by engaging with them, acknowledging, yes, I see you want that thing. You can't have it right now. Allow the little one to feel their emotions. They might be upset. They might get angry. Our job as the big people who are supposedly mature is to stay in that energy, feel the uncomfortableness of it, stay connected with them, and be with them. Not distract them, not bribe them with something else, but wait. And I can guarantee you, if you allow their stress response, so they had a little bit of a spike in activation, if you stick with that long enough, they will come down. It's our own discomfort as adults that tends to create it such that we don't stick with it long enough. But at that young age, they're actually pretty quick to shift. It's usually, usually us, the adults, the caregivers that are bothered by it, we're troubled by it, we can't handle that emotion ourselves, or maybe we want to get on with our day and it's a nuisance, and so we try to shut it down, and then what occurs is it escalates and it escalates and it escalates, and then that's where we get something like a tantrum. And a tantrum is essentially the sympathetic nervous system, that fight flight getting so ramped up and nothing is releasing. It's like a dam, right? If you think of a river and a dam, the dam is not being allowed to release little bits of water and it's building and it's building and it's building and then it just explodes. So two examples there of how as little people we start to exert and show up with our healthy aggression, our life force energy and how in a perfect world, let's just say this is the good scenario, we would want to meet them with that energy. Now there are some questions here around um, people wanting to know what to do with kiddos that are a little older, um, and I will get to those. But the main bulk of a lot of this when working with others, especially kids, we as the big people, as the mature adults, have to be comfortable with our own feelings of irritation and aggression and anger and work with it first. And the more we can be in that, the better the better we will be able to be with those little people who are essentially little animals, right? They're unrefined animals. They're trying to learn the ropes. They're trying to understand these six basic human emotions, mammalian emotions, again, happiness or joy, sadness, surprise, disgust, and anger and fear. They don't come out of the womb knowing how to deal with those things. And we need to model that in healthy, contained ways with connection. Okay, um, I'm just gonna have a quick sip of water here. Thank you for your comments. I see a thumb up, makes a lot of sense. Someone else says makes sense, such a common thing to hear. My assumption is um, with kids saying, you don't want that, that kind of thing. Um, and you say, my cousin is doing that to her little girl. Yeah, and here's the thing. We haven't been taught as an industrialized, westernized, post-agriculture society, this is the right way. And nobody wants to be brave enough to say, this is actually how it should be done, right? We have all these parenting books on all these different theories of parenting. And yet, if you go into the wild and you watch a mama lion with her little cubs, when they start to pull at her tail and nip at her, she will find a way to say, that's not cool. She doesn't, you know, shame them for their energy, but she'll, she'll also find a way to be like, yep, I hear you. And I'm going to keep playing with you a little bit. This is why animals play fight, right? They do that. Even kids roughing up with each other and play fighting is actually a very healthy part of growing up. And so we tend to shy away from actually prescribing and saying, actually, this is how 
it should be. And this is what cultures have shown and tribal cultures and animals do this. Why shouldn't we? Um, there's a proper way to do certain surgeries and everybody follows them all around the world. And I think that maybe we're missing something here and being less bold and saying, you know what, this is what we need to give children when they're young. Um, so I am going to get into a question from um, what I got through Instagram actually. So thank you for all of you guys here. Um, maybe let me know if you found me through Instagram and if you're here. So there's three questions that I'm gonna, at, that I'm gonna say out because they're all very similar. So one, what, one is, how should I deal with anger? I know I can't ignore it. So that's one, how should I deal with anger? I know I can't ignore it. What is the best method for releasing a lifetime of buried anger? Um, another, I'm easily defeated. How to become more resilient? How can I become more resilient? And then the next one, how can I use anger for action? I'm, recover I'm recovering from being a people pleaser. That's a very common thing. So I'm going to actually go backwards here. So people pleasing is kind of this new term that we're hearing. It's a bit of a epidemic, especially I live in North America. North America is quite significant for this. And it's basically making sure everything is okay so that we are not harmed. If we go back to um, that example of the baby who is expressing their life force energy and then they're shut down, they're put down um, literally like back into their crib, they're disconnected from, that little one starts to learn very, very quickly. If I do that, this isn't, I'm not okay. I lose my connection. So what that physiology, what that baby, their somatic sense, they start to please mom and dad by being the good baby, by not fussing. And I, I have very good friends um, who are colleagues and, you know, we geek out and talk about our past traumas and how they impact us in this current world because we all have them. And those who were brought up in very volatile abusive, we would call high ACE score families, ACE is Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, those kiddos who are now adults were often deemed, some of them, they were the good kid. And the good kids often are the ones that end up getting sick because they're suppressing everything inside. They're suppressing their, their anger, their rage, but even their happiness. And if I think about this one person I'm thinking of, they purposely did not do well in school because they didn't want to feel the joy and the exhilaration of doing well. So they kept themselves small, right? And it was because they needed to keep everything totally aligned in the household because the chaos was so huge and they were in a way people pleasing the entire family. So we want to realize that a lot of the ways in which we try to please and help people feel better about themselves in a way that's over the top can be linked back to having to make sure that everything in our household, our family life was level so that we wouldn't get harmed. There wouldn't be a big outroar, et cetera. Um, so then the other questions here, how do I release a lifetime of anger? Is What is the method? There is no one method. And this is where I believe we've gotten kind of messed up in how we teach this to a lot of people through various self-help practices, cathartic practices, is that anger is, again, a basic human biological primal emotion. So if our wires were not properly set up from the beginning to know how to express that healthy, aggressive life force energy... Again, this goes back to what I was talking about with the little baby starting to hit and scratch and bite and pull hair. If we didn't have that, and of course, many of us won't know because perhaps our parents are already passed, um, but let's just say that that probably didn't happen. Our way of dealing and handling and working with a lifetime of stored up anger, it has to be brought forward in an organic way by building, and now I'm going to go into sort of the elements of what it takes to heal and recover a nervous system that needs help, we need to build foundation within our system. We actually have to learn theory about what the nervous system is, how it works, 
We also have to learn to be with sensations in our body, not just the bad ones, but also the good ones, the feelings of joy and happiness. We have to be able to connect with the ground under us and the environment around us. Because again, when we've been thrown out of our, our system because of, let's say, caregiver or an environment that wasn't safe, we disconnect from our body. And we become, the, the fancy word is dysregulated in our nervous system. So to go back to this question, how should I deal with anger? I can't ignore it. You shouldn't ignore it. Um, we don't want to ignore it. We've been ignoring this emotion for a long time. And we need to be able to work with it, feel it. I, as I mentioned, the example at the beginning of this chat that feeling of when someone cuts you off in traffic, that rage, that bubble in the body, that is that is the start of being able to work with these harder and bigger emotions is feeling little bits of the emotion and then pausing and then coming back to just where you are in your current environment. So there's a concept in the work of somatic experiencing called titration, something that Peter Levine coined. Um, Peter Levine is the founder of SE, one of, one of the three things I study and practice with my work. And titration is this idea of little drops, little bits of feeling these emotions, these energies, this, these sensations. If we have a lifetime of anger that's held in our body, we can't one day just say, okay, I'm going to take this baseball bat and I'm just going to crash everything in my sight in my house. I don't care. I'm going to get it out. The trouble with this, this is called catharsis, is that if we just take that bat or we take our fists and we start punching into things or we go to boxing class or we primal scream in the woods, if we just go into that without any prep work, A, all that the body experiences is the hitting, is the screaming. It doesn't experience the connection with the pain, the hurt, the emotion, the bubbling of the physicality of that emotion, anger. And this is where it takes time, it takes practice, and it takes patience to work at building what we would call, at least in the work I do with my students in Smart Body, Smart Mind, one of my programs, we build what's called capacity. We have to have enough capacity in our physiology and our ability to sense so that we can notice when the tiniest little drop of the beginning, 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 beginning of irritation, frustration, which eventually goes to kind of pre-anger, a little bit more anger, full anger. So there's a, there's a spectrum. And usually when we start to work with this and we build more capacity, a person starts to feel something is off. I'm feeling this, uh, something isn't right. Maybe it's a tension. Maybe the hands start to ache. Maybe there's this desire to want to bite something. I mean, everyone is different. And this is why I can't give you a method of first you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this, right? It isn't like fixing a car or giving a car an oil change. Because of our organic nature, because we as humans have all had various different varying histories, because there is no one set way to raise a human child, it is in the wild, but it is different with human animals because there are so many different ways that we've been brought up and different ways that we've coped. And this is very important. The ways we've managed our emotions, the ways we've been taught to manage our emotions. It isn't easy enough for me to say, this is the method that you need to use to work with anger. And do not be discouraged by this. The reason I say that is when you can work with building capacity within your system for all of the emotions, all of the sensations, understanding your physiology, understanding the patterns of how anger was trapped in your system, how you weren't allowed to express healthy aggression and your own personal expression. When you start to work with those, you become in a way a private detective of your own system, of your own nervous system. And then you can start to listen and notice and become more um, we would call introceptive. You have a higher degree of introception in your body to know how to work with these emotions. Okay. Um, so again, 
I'm trying to sandwiching sandwich some of these questions. This comes down to how do I deal with anger? I can't ignore it. Yep, you can't. And one of the what is the best method for releasing a lifetime of anger? There isn't. It's all about building the health back to the nervous system and becoming more sensitive and more tuned and able to listen to your physiology. The other thing that goes along with this is you need to have people in your life that you feel safe with so that you can express what is happening in your system or verbalize it. One of the things that I find hardest for people when they start to do this work is they might start to experience emotions they've never felt before, impulses, things that are seemingly very odd to them, but for to me, for to me or to me and my colleagues, it's like, yeah, that's normal. That's normal. That's very normal. Um, but if we're with a, a partner or we're in a family system, maybe we're still with our mom and dad, maybe we have a group of friends and they just don't get this or they're not interested we will start to not express our full color because we fear disconnection. This comes back, again, it all comes back to how we were handled and treated as infants. If when we started to express ourselves and be really who we are and all of our craziness and exuberance and creativity, we were shut down, that is our pattern of knowing. So when we start to work with this as adults, what many of my students will find is that they will find that they can't hang out with the same people that they used to hang out with. The friend circle actually starts to diminish. However, that in my opinion is good if we can then find a few people that we can connect with who are able to be with us and meet us where we're at. I hope that makes sense. Um, I'm going to read one little comment here. Um, I know you've got a few other comments here. There's some comments about kids. Um, but Juhana says, so you shouldn't do somatic experiencing session to get rid of energy when your nervous system is in shutdown mode. So not necessarily. This is a tough, this is an interesting question because so somatic experiencing is the work of Peter Levine. It's what I'm one of the things I'm trained in. I'm also trained in Feldenkrais, the Feldenkrais method, and also somatic practice, which is the work of Kathy Kane that works with early trauma, developmental trauma. We can't just show up at a session and say, okay, I want to release energy. We can't go in with a, an intention of wanting to have a big somatic discharge and, and shaking response. And the reason why is because the work that I do and that my colleagues do and my students do, it's not that cut and dry, it's not that linear. Not to say we don't go see a somatic experiencing practitioner or a somatic therapist, but we have to show up with an open mind, an open body, so to speak, open intention. Maybe you have something specific you wanna work on, However, I've often found that someone comes in and they're like, I need to work on this. And then we start to track their physiology. We start to notice what's holding, where are the sensations, what are the images, what does your body want to do? And we follow what the body wants, where the system is going. And then, of course, with the skill of the practitioner, they see what we might need to bring more of in or less of. And it's all about containing the experience, but also allowing the system to organically show what needs to occur. So that might mean that it might mean that we have to do prep work for a few weeks, maybe a few months. Many of my students, it takes them, and don't let this scare you, but it takes them sometimes years to get to the point of being able to release and really move the energy of anger out. And the reason why, and the reason why this is good is because we know and they know that their system has been so fragile, it's been so, let's say, toxically shamed that they don't have the capacity to fully take this energy of anger out. If they do without the capacity, we risk their system basically fracturing, going into a bit of a, we would call it a, an overwhelmed state activation that's over a threshold that they can't contain and then that actually harnesses the anger to clamp down more and not want to get out. 
So to go back to how should we work with a practitioner, it all comes down to this organic experience of what is showing up now, but also having a really good relationship with your practitioner where there might be like, you know what, we have to focus on this right now. And sometimes we'll see this where clients want to take you back into an old story and it's like, nope, feel the sensation right now. We need to be with this now. And sometimes they're not ready for that and that's okay. And so it's this back and forth interaction with the practitioner. Um, in the programs I run, it's all about building capacity so people can be with what shows up so that they can move forward and release these energies. Okay. Johanna says, but if you're already feeling anger so much in you, then it doesn't mean your system is ready for somatic experiencing. No. So if we're feeling the anger in our system, then the job of the practitioner is to help the individual feel that energy and move it out in a contained and safe way. So that's the key is how we can get this energy out in a contained and safe way. And we have tools and practices that we do with people so that they can move that out. It could be through movement. It could be through making sounds. It could be through squeezing energy in the hands and feeling that big energy and letting it move through. Everyone is different. So the reason I can't show you specifics is because one thing that I show one person might be something that another person can't use. And that's where working with that practitioner or working in a system where you gain the capacity to know and say to yourself, okay, I need to pause now. That is enough. I need to wait, rest, come back to this later. Okay, I'm gonna get to another question here. Thank you guys for being here and listening. Um, Someone asks here, um, hey, Irene, I feel like my repressed anger um, is has been around for a few months and it's manifested as a 24-7 headache. How is that possible? I feel like my nervous system won't allow me to feel the emotion of anger, just the pain. Can I somehow just, just discharge it? I really need help and I am stuck. So this comes back to what we were just talking about. So when we trap emotion, and it could be any emotion, all of the emotions I've mentioned. So sadness, uh, fear, even joy, um, disgust, surprise. So all of the emotions. But anger, of course, is a big one. When we trap these emotions inside of the system, it can manifest as pain. So Peter Levine, again, I'll quote him again one more time. He has said often that pain is trapped sensation. So pain is trapped sensation. It can be emotional pain, it could be mental pain, it could be actual physical pain. And what I've experienced, so you've got this head of yours here, the system has these various levels. In Western osteopathic medicine, we would call it diaphragms, these different levels where the body has these containers of space. And those containers of space hold what we would call emotion and energy and our affect. In Eastern traditions, some of you might know, these spaces are called chakras. To me, they're kind of the same thing in that you've got these spaces that hold emotion and we want these containers, these spaces to have flow in them. We want them to be able to have the ability for them to be flow in those containers, but also between all of the containers. And so if we are trapping and holding an emotion such as anger, and let's just say, I'm going to be hypothetical, it needs to come out as a as something in the voice. Maybe there's something that needs to be said. Maybe someone wronged us and we weren't able to tell them what we needed to say. And so we've kept it in our throat. We've kept it in our heart. And we actually, it will also show up in our lower kind of diaphragms and chakras in a tightness, in a lack of grounding, because we're holding all this in. It's like having these balloons all pressurized and then poof, pops up to the head, the pressure pops up to the head and then we feel it as this intense pressure and pain, which is what a headache is. It's pressure, it's this lack of flow. And so this is normal in that this is, this is what we see. Um, you say it won't me allow me to feel the emotion of anger, just the pain. So this is where, um, for the person who asked this question, for all of you that might have this kind of symptomology, 
This is where you've got to, again, I go back to capacity. So, so if there's pain, can you feel the pain? Can you talk to the pain? Does the pain have a color? Does it have an image to it? Does the pain want to speak? If the pain could talk, what would it say? Does the pain want to do an action? So rather than trying to find the anger, and if it's not there, we can't find it, we start with what is there. And so there's pain. And so what we do um, is, or what else, or what I would do if with a session, if I was working with someone, or if I was working with my students, it would be okay, well, can you get really interested in that pain? What can you do to befriend that pain and talk to that pain and see what it has to say? And with each question or with each inquiry that you're doing, sense in the body, track in the body, have your eyes be open and be able to see, or maybe your eyes have to be closed. Again, you see, I can't say close your eyes and go inside. For some people, they do that and everything shuts down. Some people do that and everything lights up. Some people, their eyes open and everything shuts down. Some people, their eyes open and all of a sudden like, oh, I can feel it. So this is where, again, this work to me is like art. It's creative. It's all about learning the basic skills at the beginning so that we can track these sensations, track these emotions, and not try to produce something that we think has to happen. So a lot of times someone might be like, I have repressed anger. That must mean that I have to scream and hit and punch. Might not be. It might be, but it might not be. It might be that that anger is deep, deep pain, emotional pain, because we were never allowed to, let's say, express when we were young. And that was hurtful. And it was sad. And we might need to grieve that that we lost in childhood. And then we might need to realize, oh, let's grieve that. And then let's also realize now that I can choose my actions as an adult and consciously choose who I hang out with and who supports me over time, our safety map starts to build. And as our safety map starts to build, what do you think happens with the nervous system? it starts to feel more safe. And with more safety, we are then able to express and feel more nuance. When we're trapped in unsafety, all we notice is danger and real specifics. And so part of this work, part of curating and cultivating the nervous system's health is to become more diverse in how we notice it as opposed to just noticing it in one way, right? So I would encourage you guys here that when you feel a specific thing, can you get really interested in it? Like you're just investigating it and creating a project on it for class. It's like, this is what I noticed. This is what happened. This is what my body wanted to do, etc. Okay. I want to get to um, the, the, the connection between um, anger and disgust. And then I'm going to wrap back to some kid stuff. So question here, the relationship, what is the relationship between anger and disgust? Um, and I did another post on this a little while back, you guys. So Crystal, if you're there, maybe you can find that disgust, um, distaste article that I have. There's a, it's hard to miss on my blog. It's me making a funny face of disgust. Um, so what's the relationship between anger and disgust? I did an exercise where I was meant to express anger. Listen up, guys. This is important. But pure disgust towards another person came out. Hey, how may this be connected? So first of all, congratulations for actually connecting these two because you are on point. So this goes back, actually, believe it or not, to our early childhood years. Um, so let's just say that we had an environment, I'm going to be hypothetical here. So my sense is, if this is occurring, there was some elements of talk, if not some lots of elements of toxic shame in your household in your environment. So toxic shame is basically being belittled, it's being laughed at, it's being told, you suck, you're never going to be good at anything. Um, how could you possibly do that? Don't be an idiot. You know, your sister can do this so much better. Why can't you be like this? I think you might get it. So that real sharp, bad, toxic venom that sadly is so common in our society with kiddos 
um, usually because the parent themselves haven't done their own work on working with their own early patterns of being shamed and, and punished in a way that wasn't good. And so let's just say that was the case. And that little person was old enough to feel their emotions and feel their hurt. And they were toxically shamed and their internal biology is to strike that parent or is to call them a name or hit them. But they know probably through experience, if they do that, they might get hit back or they might be told to go to their room or go to the corner or go sit on the step or you have to have a timeout. All these things that we do that disconnect us from our children as opposed to being with their discomfort. I talked about this at the top of the hour. So if you're just joining me now, be sure to go back. So let's just say hypothetically that that happens. We're toxically shamed. The little person feels their fight energy. They want to be like, screw you. That's not nice. But they don't because if they do that, they get into trouble. What happens is when we're toxically shamed, we literally get this sense. And I talk about this in this article we feel as though we are bad meat. Those are Peter Levine's words, not mine. We sense that we are literally rotten. You know those sayings, that, that saying that some people say to kids, you're so spoiled rotten, you're such a rotten child. How could you do such a thing? That is implying to that little being who is not mature enough to deal with this, I am rotten, I'm bad meat, and I'm disgusting, and I suck. And so what happens is this shame, disgust, anger thing, they get coupled together. And so this person is saying, I was meant to do an exercise or I did an exercise to express anger and all I got was pure disgust. This is why I cannot say to you, I want you to take this baseball bat and do this exercise because it's meant to express anger. Because if there isn't enough of a slowing down and enough foundation on board to actually feel that anger in a healthy way, in a way that has power, we will flip to feeling that disgust and that horribleness towards ourselves. And then it sets up this shame cycle. And then this sets up a cycle of depression. And so the story goes. So the, these elements, they do go together. And this is why I might sound like a broken record, but it is not enough to just be like, I'm going to punch and I'm going to hit, and then that's going to get my anger out. It won't. It will not. What has to occur as adults, at least I'm talking about adults now, is we need to connect with the internal qualities. We need to build our capacity so that we can get this out and, and be okay with moving this anger out. One of the primary things that I see with my, my folks, my clients, especially in private practice, when there was a lot of early childhood adversity, neglect, things were scary, they are often frightened at expressing any kind of anger and energy because it, it displays potentially what they saw too much of when they were growing up, or they knew when they expressed that they were harmed even more. And so it's terrifying. And so we, when we work with anger and that anger comes out organically and in a good way, and it could be through maybe hitting something, it might be through screaming, it might be through, you know, scratching at a pillow. Those things are still valid, but it has to be because you don't, you so want to. There's this itching, this energy, this like, oh my goodness, I just want to. But the, the feeling that we want to really connect with is the feeling before the hit, the feeling before the scratch, the feeling before the expression, and then we move it out. But we need to connect to that internal feeling. Um, I hope that makes sense. Again, this is Q&A. This is giving you theory to really do the work. You're going to want to, whether you work with myself or with a colleague of mine who is trained in somatic experiencing at a pretty high level, um, it's important to um, know that this is not something that can happen in one weekend workshop um, at all. Um, so that was, uh, again, just to review the connection between disgust, anger, and toxic shame. I just, we posted an article there that I talked to talk about a bit more about it. Um, 
Okay. I'm going to answer a, a more general question because I want to um, get a little bit to kiddos because there's always questions about kids. And um, I'm going back in the comments. Someone says, can you say more about meeting that energy when a five and a half year old is screaming in dialogue, not just content to scream, but insists on highly controlled dialogue where she has rigid rules. So that's a bit too specific for me to get into, but here's what we know is that when a kid is at that level of tantruming or expressing in that way, we need to look at attunement. We need to look at at what point did that ability to connect and feel their energy go off. Now, a lot of the questions I get are my, my children um, get angry very easily. They don't know how to express it or I'm trying to get them to express it and then it goes sideways. So there's a few things that I think need to be um, looked at. The one is, were there any past traumas that might be unresolved or untreated that need to be looked at. Because sometimes the expression or explosion of anger in kids and obviously adults um, can be for good reason. So another article that I, you guys have your homework cut out for you that I want you to look at is, um, and Crystal, my assistant can post it below. Um, I might get the title wrong, but it's nine uh, experiences, human experiences that we often deem as not traumatic, but they are. So nine common experiences that we don't deem as traumatic, but they are. These are things like being born prematurely, um, undergoing dental procedures, medical procedures, um, intergenerational trauma, believe it or not. So if we have repressed an old anger in our systems from our childhoods and our parents' childhoods, they've done a lot of work on this with Holocaust survivors who have had children, there is an imprint of anxiety within the DNA and fear that carries on through generations. It doesn't have to carry on. We know this because we can change it, but we have to change it in our family system for that to shift. So um, intergenerational trauma, um, like I said, um, surgeries are big ones, as are little tiny insidious things that we almost don't deem of as traumatic like um, forcing children to not, or not allowing children to express their bodily functions. So this is gonna sound simple, and yet it isn't, and that our culture has, has kind of deemed if we um, pass gas or we burp in public, we have to be told to say, excuse me, we're shamed often, people laugh like it's a joke. These are our biological functions, and it starts very young. And if we can start to teach ourselves as adults, but also our kids to just be free with these bodily impulses. I know this seems like a strange leap to anger, but it actually connects. If we can start expressing bodily emotions without any positivity or negativity, just neutral, that's just the way it is. This starts to teach them that ability. Um, and this is something, again, completely, uh, work with my students with in trying to express our healthy impulses through these biological um, needs. So where was I going with that? So kids, the biggest thing that you can do for your children if you're finding that they're expressing their anger and it's too much or maybe they can't get it out and we can't go into all of this right now, but you wanna start working with your own first. And the more we can stay with our sensations and teach ourselves to have more capacity and be more contained and work with our own bodies and our own physiology, that will teach our children how to connect with theirs. With kids, typically they need to play. They need to get energy out through play, through activity, through expression, um, through things that might seem super silly to us and don't even make sense. But see, that's where sometimes we go wrong is they'll tell us something that seems really crazy and maybe not real and we don't agree with them. Or we say, oh, that's not possible, that's not true. And yet the moment we do that, we are shutting their life force energy down. 
right? So this ability, when you have a little person who's playing and doing all sorts of crazy things, we want to be able to say, wow, that's so cool. I really love how you just did that. Can you show me how you do, might do that with your body, right? And this is where play therapy with kids is very important. But it also is important for humans that are older, for us big people. So this ability to allow kids to truly express is important. If a child has not been allowed that and now they're a little older and they're being explosive in their anger and in their energy, we still kind of have to help them get that out. And while this might seem difficult, sometimes they need to be shown, I'm going to let you do that. I'm going to let you get this energy out. You can't hurt me. You can't hurt our stuff. But here's what you can do. And I'm going to be there with you as you do that right? That is a very important element to making kids feel safe, is being able to connect with them, let them show their emotion, their energy, not walk away, stay with them. We have to be with our own sensation, feel our own energy without shutting down, and then work with that within our own system. And they will feel that within us. And you just have to try it. Okay. I know this has been a long, we're about an hour now, we're going through a lot of information. Um, the key to know is this, the energy of anger is human, it's biological, it's here. And so we need to honor that, we need to say to ourselves, this is a general emotion, it's a normal emotion, it's important, we need to work with it. Most of us haven't been brought up in a way where that has been given to us, and so we need to kind of reverse engineer and learn a bit more about it, learn about how to be with our sensations, be with our kids when they're feeling these intense emotions, never discredit them, never laugh at them, never make fun of them. Be like, whoa, that's big energy and let's play with that. And here, I'll join you, right? That's what they want. They want to know that what they're feeling is okay. Anything that anybody feels is okay because it's what they're feeling. And we get into trouble because we say that what they're feeling isn't right or they shouldn't be feeling that. So just know, anger, it's a biological emotion. We need it. When we suppress it, it does make us sick. And then it becomes explosive. And so we want to be able to work with it in small little ways. If you would like to learn more, obviously, come check me out on my website, irenelyon.com. I have a lot of articles there, a lot of vlogs. I've got this YouTube channel. Search for the word anger, Google it with me. I've got, art again, articles. One of them is um, on anger being medicine. If you look that up, you'll find that. Um, keep learning, keep expressing, keep knowing that your system is a biological system that wants to have all these spectrums of emotions and they're real and they're okay. You know that they're okay. They're okay. You're meant to have this energy. You're meant to have life force energy. You're meant to be able to say, I want that. I don't want that, right? Because again, anger comes into this ability to set boundaries, but also to be able to move forward. So thank you everybody for being here. We're going to be doing more of these live chats. If I didn't get to your specific question, it wasn't on purpose. It's just because again, this topic is big. It takes a while to unpack. I hope you continue to learn. I hope you continue to be curious about this information and check out all the things that we offer over on my site. We'd love to see you there and in our various Facebook groups on Instagram and of course on YouTube. All right, everybody, I am going to end our chat for today and we will see you next time. Bye for now.